Well, we are live now, and um, welcome to everybody who's online, and thank you for joining us. My name is Aman Madan, and I teach at Azim Premji University. And uh, what I'll be talking about today is, as the the slide on your screen says to you, is about how to promote uh, love, dialogue, and justice through education. And uh, before that, before I talk about how to promote it, I will first start by talking about why should one promote this. You know, why should one promote love, dialogue, justice? Uh, well, it's because basically there are a great many conflicts and contradictions in our lives, and uh, which is not a problem, not always a problem. Conflicts and contradictions are good. That's how societies change. You know, through conflicts. Uh, they're good because they make us rethink things, they make us improve things. Uh, suppose uh, I'm from a social group which has been humiliated for centuries, you know, which has been denied access to even basic resources like education or land. Uh, when I began to protest, when I began to, when I begin to uh, demand my fair dues, um, there's a conflict, you know. Uh, which will eventually improve things for my group, which will also help other people to change their way of thinking, help other people to improve. So uh, we, have, we will always be having many kinds of conflicts. Conflicts can be good. Conflicts can be destructive. You know, uh, They're not necessarily a bad thing. They're not always a good thing. What we do need to do, however, is how do we get our conflicts to go into constructive directions, which uh, uh, actually lead to some solutions, rather than only to be destructive and keep hitting out in a random way, just hurting each other, not getting anywhere. My uh, main theme will be about uh, how we can actually use love dialogue to be a way of moving towards justice and I will try to talk about this as a constructive way of moving towards justice. Now, uh, perhaps many of the members of my audience will immediately be saying and thinking to themselves, you know, isn't this very idealistic? Isn't this impractical? You know, isn't it normal that we have to actually fight and quarrel and beat each other so as to get justice in the world? You know, what is all this talk about love and dialogue? Uh, how can they possibly get a justice? Now, to understand this, to understand the place of love and dialogue, let us first try to map out what are the many ways through which we can struggle, which we can work to resolve our problems with others you know, and to get what we think is just. What are the many ways? And then let's try to locate the place of love and dialogue in that. So there are many people who have tried to understand this, who have tried to theorize this. Uh, this is a basic categorization. Um, let's suppose we have a situation, you know, where um, uh, I'm a teacher in a school and the principal comes to me suddenly. I, I'm already teaching my full load. The principal comes to me and says, uh, look, come on, you have to from tomorrow teach one more class. I freeze. I'm scared to death. One more class, I'm just barely surviving. How do I do one more class? Now, what are the ways of dealing with a thing like this? Here are some of the ways. Let's look at them. A first very common way is what many analysts call uh, contending or asserting or confronting. So I tell the teacher, the, the principal, I'm the teacher. I tell the principal, are you mad? You know, are you crazy? I'm already, you know, snowed under with work. I'm drowning in work. And you're giving me more stuff. I'm just not going to do it. You, you are mad. Just get out. Just get lost. You know, there's one way of dealing with it. You know, it's a confronting, putting my view through very strongly and not listening to his issues. This is what we call a contending kind of an approach, an asserting kind of an approach. A second kind of an approach is to withdraw. So I say, look, I'm sorry, I can't handle this. I quit. I resign. I withdraw. A third kind of approach 
to avoid you know i i didn't hear that you know this was kind of just disappear from there i didn't hear what i said i'm i'm avoiding the situation it's a third way of dealing with issues in our life the fourth way and which is what we will talk about here is what many analysts call a problem solving approach a dialogic approach having a dialogue collaborating to find a common solution so maybe i say to the principal you know that um uh first of all i asked the principal look why do you want me to take one more class i'm already so i'm doing so much why, why do you want me to take one more class then maybe the principal tell me the reason the reason uh principal may have in mind is look so and so teacher suddenly left suddenly quit and left now we are stuck what do we do with that class tomorrow who is going to go to that classroom can you please go and take or take that over now i better understand where that person is coming from this is the dialogic approach i ask i try to understand where is that person coming from and then maybe i say mm, yeah this is really a big issue you know that person has suddenly left what do we do with that class uh, but you know since i'm already at a full load that particular teacher i don't know if you know that you know actually is working on a half load do you think we could request that person to take it over you know maybe you could just check with that person here's a possible solution you know here is an attempt to have a dialogue what i'm trying to to depict you know what i'm trying to show is that very basically that there are several approaches to dealing with issues um contending is probably the most common in our country but a lot of people also do the other kinds and uh what i'm trying to suggest is that perhaps a dialogic way also works very well you know now of course sometimes it's best to confront somebody says something terribly wrong you know which you just cannot accept maybe not always maybe the best way to deal with that is to confront it sometimes it may be best to withdraw uh however whatever one does eventually if now if we still have to live with each other if we still want to live in the same world together we still eventually have to have a dialogue how long will i keep confronting you know eventually that person i that group and my group will have to have some kind of a dialogue where we try to understand each other and try to find some solution which works for both groups you know eventually we will have to do that so how does one do that uh that's what we will be looking at and how does one possibly try to teach about that now is it always possible to have a dialogue suppose uh, you know what happens if the the other group doesn't want to talk you know or the other person just doesn't want to talk then what do i do uh, when is it that people agree to have a dialogue now people usually agree to have a dialogue let me go to my next slide uh for two three kinds of reasons one is a dialogue becomes possible uh it's not possible if one group usually is too powerful the other group is too powerless the first group thinks why bother to have a dialogue i can get whatever i want i don't need to have a dialogue they are so powerful so one of the conditions not always but one of the conditions usually is that both the groups must be at a kind of a stalemate where they must be thinking that look uh, just steamrolling the other group uh, confronting just asserting my position and getting it will not work maybe it's actually uh, faster maybe it's cheaper to have a dialogue instead you know? or maybe it's uh, the the trying to steamroll bully the other group just won't work so i have no option but to have a dialogue so one situation in which people have a dialogue is when there is a kind of an equality of power where one group can't be so powerful that they don't need to have a dialogue at all that's one condition however you may also have a second kind of a condition it's possible that uh, uh, a group may have lot of power but still have a culture of dialogue no so even though i have a lot of power still i believe in talking i still i believe in understanding that may happen uh, you may also have a situation where 
uh, the groups, two groups are both at a are of equal power. They are fighting and fighting and fighting with each other, but they don't have a culture of dialogue. What happens typically in such a situation, when two groups are equal in power and they're keeping on fighting, they don't have a culture of dialogue. They just keep on fighting, and it becomes pointless. You know, because neither of them is getting anywhere. They're just beating each other up. Not, but nothing is happening. No group is winning. But if they don't have a culture, they don't know how to have a dialogue. They will still not have a dialogue. So the second thing, having a culture, is important. You know, uh, having a culture of dialogue makes it possible to have a dialogue. Even when people have a great inequality of power, they may still want to have a dialogue because they have a culture of dialogue. And also, as I said. when they are of equal power even then having a culture of dialogue actually helps to get them to move somewhere you know of course now uh, uh this culture has to be cultivated which is what we were talking about uh uh the reason for for doing this the reason for preferring dialogue and problem solving um there may be many good reasons for that one basic problem with the confrontational approach with a contending aggressive approach wanting to just get my way without listening the problem with fundamentally with this approach is who wins what we decide to do what my principal and i between us what we decide to do between two groups of the government and the farmers two groups any two groups if we are just using the contending approach you know the who what will be finally be done will decide will be decided not by what is right but by who is more powerful now this is a problem very often just being powerful does not make you right if we want and that's my third point on this slide if we want to decide things on the basis of what is right what is good for everybody what is correct what is what is what should be done for everybody that is a very good reason to focus on dialogue based approaches rather than contending approaches and because as we said by contending uh, by by confronting by being aggressive uh, the danger is the group which wins will be the stronger group but not the group which is right that's a danger so cultivating a dialogic approach has many advantages again it's not that this will always work or it's always the best uh, different situations but it 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 helps so uh, what i'm saying is in countries like ours in societies like ours uh, dialogue is a good thing to cultivate and uh, people are more likely to follow it when a there is a balance of power uh b when there is a culture that promotes dialogue so that's why perhaps we need to think about love and dialogue now in the rest so far i've been talking about why do we need to promote this now what i will talk about from now onwards is how you know how do we create that culture by educational work you know which can be in schools in colleges with youth groups uh with within organizations workshops and organizations in companies whatever how do we create this culture of dialogue now there's a lot of work done on this uh unfortunately our schools uh, as we all know uh, seem to be focusing only on how to um you know teach children to get a job uh that also perhaps not always very well uh but these kind of things how do you how do you sort out your basic issues with each other how do we create a culture of dialogue not many schools pay attention to that there are some and which is very nice there are some teachers who do this uh, but mostly people are not paying attention to this but there is a lot of work which has been done on this around the world and also people working on this in india which is just quickly to um uh, give you a few names and a few things for example in india professor krishna kumar has done some very interesting work in this there is um, there are there are many traditions oh, i'll just skip this slide where oh, i'm am i jumping slides ah yes i'm jumping slides all right never mind so uh uh 
let me just ignore the slides for the for the present and um 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 let me just read out from my my own slides that i have and talk about this um so there's a lot of people who have done a lot of work on this and let me see if i can find some way of closing these slides yes right okay so there's just you and me now <laughs> so a lot of people who have done this. there are people who have worked in anthropology people who worked in political science social psychology there's an entire area called peace education the lot of people who have done many kinds of work and in this uh uh this so far i'm talking about the names of the areas i've talked about are from western academics uh some names over here people like frederick bath have done very interesting work uh nana uh, arent's work on not on violence is so important many people you know uh, people like jeffrey rubin has done a lot of work on understanding conflicts and understanding problem solving approaches to dealing with conflicts adam hates yuan galtung betty reard and there are a number of people who have done on this in non western scholarship scholarship which is not from the western academic tradition again you'll find lot of work of very different traditions the buddhist tradition particularly has done very interesting work in this many of us uh, are familiar with the work of uh, unfortunately just passed away a few days ago uh, thich nahat han you know has done very nice work on these things uh, people have been trying ideas from advait uh philosophy from jainism from uh, islam from sikhism christianity bhakti sufism you'll find not all of the people in in this in each of these but there are very important voices in each of these tradition who have been talking about dialogue uh social and political movements you'll find um uh indian freedom struggle actually is studied by people around the world as an example of how to uh resist a very powerful force the british colonial rulers were so powerful they had so many guns so many soldiers and yet we struggle against them without soldiers mostly uh this is studied around the world as an example of how it is possible to use a politics of love and a politics of dialogue to struggle against a very powerful group but there are many other movements around the world which have worked on this the american civil rights movement has is famous and they actually developed a lot of training techniques some of which i'll be also talking about today a lot of training techniques that how do you stand up against very powerful groups and still do a politics which is the politics of love with them you know uh, many groups uh, anti war movements have been doing very good work on this again around the world each of these has contributed to understanding what should be done about a uh, human strife by communicating by teaching young people to deal with that to deal with violence conflict struggle through processes of love and dialogue how do you deal with this each of these has contributed in different ways many teachers many educationists have been trying out different things some of which i'll talk about in 2 minutes um again it's very unfortunate that our larger culture does not pay attention to this uh, but this is really worth uh, working upon um what i will do right now is to identify some broad thrust areas and give a few examples uh, just to show the kind of work which is being done I, in 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 a, say 30 40 minutes i can't give all details but just to give you some examples i'll kind of show um a lot of things of course need to be done outside the school let's not think that the school can solve everything we do these things in schools in colleges and everything will become all right no a lot of things also need to be done outside the schools you know, to create a world where dialogue solves problems not violence but there are still a number of things which we can do with youth which we can do with children in schools outside schools uh even if they cannot solve everything no solution is possible without working with young people on this see what i'm saying it's not that just by working with young people 
we can create a very different world but that different world is not going to come without working with young people so we have to work with young people even though it's not enough but we have to work so what are the things that can be done one so three major things i'll talk about today one major thing is building a human connect between people building a human connect learning to love not just oneself but also other groups other individuals and other social groups this is the first thing building a human connect a second thing i'll talk about is how does one talk about issues in a dialogic and compassionate way how to talk about these things three the third thing i will talk about is how does one learn to feel for justice how does one learn to think about justice so three things three things which can be done with young people how to connect with others how to talk in a dialogic way how to feel and think about moral questions about justice the first one then uh, about loving other people see this is the basis actually for a lot of things all actions for doing what is right for thinking about what is right uh, actually have to be based ultimately on human bonding human love if i don't have human bonding why should i care what's happening to the other person i only care when there is a bonding between me and other people when there's a love between people what is love a big question there are many kinds of love uh behind all of them is this what i've been calling speaking of as bonding between people where people begin to see others as also part of themselves at least partially not completely maybe but at least partly this is a connecting this is a kind of a fusing of boundaries you know uh, now usually we think of this is us that is them there's a boundary between us when this boundary begins to open up a little bit that's when bonding happens that's when love happens uh when people begin to love each other even while they are aware that they are different individuals different communities uh there is also a sense of being concerned about the others if there's no love there's no concern but that's only when there is some love some bonding that there is concern for others for example let when there's a father who loves his son you know and the son falls sick or gets hurt or something happens the father feels very troubled why should the father feel troubled it's because of that bonding it's because that that sense of who one is and who that person is actually have become intermixed in some way you know there's a fusing of boundaries uh, of course this this fusing of boundaries this love can be really complicated there can be all kinds of relationships of power where you know, uh, you know love can be used as a way of controlling people love cannot need not be a simple thing but love human bonding fusion is at the heart of finding all solutions that focus on morality and on reasoning and not on just trying to overpower and dominate others if i want to have some dialogue when i'd be thinking about oh, is this right is this wrong it needs some way it needs to have love for the other group some bonding with the other group you know some connectedness with other if that is not there there's no possibility you know if i think that the other group for example is just an animals you know they're kid em accord you know they they like insect somewhere i there's no this why should i feel concerned about what they are so part of the effort is getting groups to feel connected with each other if we deal with issues with love we will be concerned you know with of course our point of view what we think is right but we will also ultimately want the well-being of the other also now this is a huge issue because as i said in our country many of our problems are because uh, there's a tremendous hatred and distrust between social groups and the sense that you know i just cannot feel what they feel and i'm not interested in their welfare this this causes enormous this spirals into many issues so if we want to promote a culture of dialogue one of the first things we need to also promote alongside that is a culture of connectedness and which we'll come to in a minute how do we do that uh 
or let me start talking about this. So this is the educational question. How does one promote this love, this empathy, this feeling what others feel, this feeling for other groups, for other social for the social groups, other individuals, between different castes, between different classes, different religions, different linguistic groups, different genders? How does one promote this? Uh, the answer to this, many people have been asking this question and they have been saying that the answer to this lies, there is an answer to this. The answer to this lies in the fact that basically all human beings have both the capacity to love people within their own group and also a capacity to hate people who are not of their group. They have this capacity, this basic to humans. We will, we, the moment we start feeling these people are ours, we, we, we bond with them. Uh, and the reverse also, when we start feeling those are others, there's a tendency to dislike and not feel them. So what is the solution? Uh, many educationists say that the solution to this, and as I said, people is coming from work in a number of disciplines, uh, say that the way to get around this is f find out what are those conditions in which I, my usual boundaries of this is us begin to be porous, you know, when they open up. And I begin to allow other people into my sense of who is us. Uh, what are those conditions which we can create in schools and workshops for this to begin to happen? Teachers and educators have found many ways of doing this. There are some basic uh, principles here. I probably have time to talk of only a few of them. Maybe I'll just talk about one uh, or maybe two or three more also. One of the basic principles is which educationists have been doing. They are saying that we get a lot of images from around us, from our culture, uh, which, uh, uh, which make us afraid of other groups, which promote images of other groups only in scary ways. You know, that I'm scared of them. They're all the time, I see only threatening images of other groups. Uh, and images which then reinforce my desire that if I want to be all right, if my group has to be all right, I have to keep attacking that group. So I'm continuously getting such images, scary images of other groups, or images which may not be scary, but which are humiliating. Uh, where, where I see the other group as not as a full human being who can feel like me, who can think like me, but as you know, somehow objects of some kind who are not thinking, who are not feeling. This is what usually happens. So how do educationists get around it? By consciously, deliberately introducing images into their uh, teaching. Images, examples, stories, read stories in storybooks, in social studies, have examples, have lessons, which begin to humanize other communities, where other groups, other individuals, other groups, other genders begin to appear not as that is a woman or that is a man. Of course, that's a woman, that's a man, but also a human being. You know, where we get people feeling, thinking, experiencing, bring such stories and conscious, don't hide their identities. Now, one of the mistakes many people may, according to this literature, this kind of research, is while doing this, for example, I'm, I'm, I want I'm, I, for example, I'm in, a, in an all boys school. I want boys to start treating girls as human beings, not just sexual objects, but as human beings. Uh, a mistake I can make is, is to have a story where the girl is doing everything like a boy. Um, that's not enough. That's a good beginning, it's not enough. I must emphasize that identity also. And along with that, reinforce the idea that this is a human being. Now the point is don't hide identities. These people are saying, if we hide identities, for example, I'm working, I, I want children, I'm working with children from powerful jatis, powerful castes. I want them to start considering less powerful jatis as also human beings. Don't hide caste, acknowledge caste, talk about caste. And in the stories that one is using, bring that out you know uh, i don't know if my slides are working now 
no it's not working anyway the, uh, one of the great examples i wanted to show you is so those of you who have read stories in hindi uh, will always be fa familiar with premchand's eedga you know it's a uh, uh for and and since i know many of my audience will not be knowing hindi uh oh there it is great thank you so much <laughs> thank you sanjana yeah so here is a picture of premchand sidka uh and uh, um uh what is special about this story it's a story of a muslim child and muslim identity is prominent in it not hiding you know not saying oh this is just a human being forget religion A lot of research says that does not work. If I want people, other children, see, other children are in a world where most of the time the images they see of Muslims on television and other places are only as terrorists. You know, some terrorist got caught, or somebody is threatening somebody, and that's a Muslim image you see. You see the Taliban and all this. That's a Muslim. It's a scary thing. That's how most children are. Many children are not. Many children are seeing Muslims, and and they're scared. Now here is a story which talks about this child who is a very poor child. Uh, the child ha has only a grandmother. The grandmother gives the child a small amount of money. That there's go to the Eid Ga Eid. The festival of Eid is is going on. At Eid Ga, everybody goes and buys something, some trinket, some th something people buy. So gives the child a little bit of money to go and buy something. The child goes there with a lot of friends. The friends are all well off. They got a lot of money. Somebody buys sweet. Somebody buys something else. Has a good time. This boy has only a small amount of money, and he keeps thinking, "What do I buy? What do I buy?" Finally, he remembers that whenever his poor grandmother is making rotis for him, she always burns her fingers because she doesn't have a pair of tongs. You know, she doesn't have a chimta. That's what he buys, and he comes home with this for his grandmother. That this is what I got for you from the Eidka. It's a classic story, very popular, very moving. Uh, it happens to be about a Muslim, you know, and Muslim identity is prominent in it. Uh, without saying that, look, Muslims are also human beings, you know. Yet this has an impact. It has an impact. It has had an impact on millions of children down the generations. You know. This is an example of what I'm talking about. So there's a lot of research which which shows that such work humanizes other groups, humanizes other jatis, humanizes other genders. Uh, treat when I'm I'm doing things in my school consciously. I have to choose stories. I have to choose examples. I have to choose films. which humanizes other social groups that is the key to forming bonds between groups you know there's lot more work i don't have time to talk about all of that um uh one of the things people do is promote cooperative learning learn in groups uh form groups to do things that makes a difference uh making sure that we are playing games which are cooperative games makes a difference uh uh of course you must have children of different communities in the school uh, which is a big challenge now in in a lot of private schools uh, but it's 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 necessary if i don't have children of other communities how will children make friends with other other communities you know with other castes other religions other genders uh, i need to have them only then can we do it but if they are there games cooperative games cooperative learning many things people do uh uh to do, to to promote bonds between people now of course there are complications in this uh, um it doesn't always work it works under certain conditions there can be better ways of doing this there can be not so good ways of doing this which i'll come to later if i have the time you know now let me go to the second thing which is how do you teach uh dialogue yeah thank you so much sanjay that's my that was my slide of the things to do uh, sorry i i i should go back sorry sanjay can you help me go back yeah thank you um all right but let me go to my next point um how do you promote dialogue then the first was how do you promote bonding between social groups uh and i give you just one example there is a lot of work around that uh the next second major thing is how do we teach children to have a dialogue and uh 
how do we teach children this 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 this, this deals with several things how do we teach children to talk about issues even the most difficult issues without being at each other's throats you know how do we teach children to talk about things uh, uh and make progress on them without making the other person other party other group defensive and closed you know so that they don't close their minds so that i can have a conversation this is dialogue so what is dialogue a dialogue is a kind of a conversation where people don't just try to impose their view on each other you know i'm right you're wrong but try to listen and understand the other person in this uh yeah thank you so here are a number of things which we'll do let me explain the idea of dialogue first then we'll talk about some of this and this is taught in school this can be taught in school this can be taught in workshops this can be taught in youth clubs uh in dialogue one tries to listen and understand the other person one also tries to help the other person understand what i am saying you know uh, i consciously put my points in such a language that other person can understand me and i don't put it in a way where the other person just reacts and closes the mind consciously i find language where uh, i try not to trigger off the person but help the person to understand what am i trying to say uh crucial here is where one is not trying to somehow overcome the other i however strongly i may feel for myself but i am starting by saying that let's be open you know i can't tell the other person to be open and myself not be open so i also have to be open let's try to uh uh think about things now uh, uh try to think about things in a way where we both try to respect each other's humanity uh this is learnable you know you may say how can you learn to it's learnable uh this of course works best when there's a relationship of care so that first thing is quite important you know when there is a relationship of feeling for people then dialogue is much easier to to build over there if if um, that is not present then if i want to have a dialogue i have to also work on that without that dialogue doesn't go very far i must work on both things simultaneously uh so this uh, dialogue works best when it works between when it is being done between two groups who are willing to take each other's concerns seriously which feel for each other's welfare that's when it works best this sometimes happens when both groups are of equal power they have no option now if they want to move forward they have to pay attention to the other group's interests also however it can also happen when the two groups care for each other you know so promoting care for each other is really important for dialogue how does one learn to have a dialogue many things people have done i'll just give you one example out of these several things uh, which people have done um uh, which is the first thing which is written which is something called active listening learning to listen to people how is this taught learning to listen to people is very important because until i really know what is their issue i can't really resolve it and this can be a this this let us not assume that we are always listening we, it is so common to find that in issues people are not really listening to what is that group's problem uh, and they are not really listening to me to find out what is my problem so if we create a culture if, we, if more and more young people learn to listen that reduces a lot of issues and helps those issues to get some move somewhere learning to listen is important how do we teach children to learn to listen one of those ways there are many ways one of those ways is for example i have a class i make i say okay today one hour we are going to spend practicing listening to each other how do we do that we form groups of 4 4 5 5 students circles and the task is one person will start and one child will first talk about his or her problems for 5 to 10 minutes whatever any problem that you have you share the other people in that group you have to listen quietly and you have to make a list of these four things one so so they are given a task one person is to share the problems the rest are given a task the task is listen to these four things firstly what are the facts which this person is putting 
in front of you what are the facts this person is talking about second what are the feelings this person is expressing you know it very often the facts are something else i'm talking about something else but actually the, my feelings are something else the real problem is my feelings not those facts so pay attention to the feelings also third pay attention to the values behind this what are the values underlying all of this fourth pay attention to the body language you know uh, and after hearing all of this paraphrase it repeat it to that person and say is this what you were saying is this what you were feeling it's a small activity remarkably powerful you know and so uh, it it has a tremendous impact both on the person who's doing the talking and those who are listening after one person has done this then we rotate then the second person the group does and the third person so over an hour over 45 minutes an hour all four or five members have done this uh this has a tremendous impact on and it builds a culture of listening why this is so important is for example you know typical kind of problem like we keep sharing here also uh in all the universities i've ever taught hostel food is always a problem not because hostel food is bad but for other reasons so when a student comes to me i'm a warden student comes to me and says you know hostel food is so bad it's so terrible i'm fed up with this food i'm listening to that but i'm not just listening to what the person is saying i'm listening to the feelings where is this coming from usually you know uh usually uh uh what is coming over here is not that the food is not nutritious but that i'm bored with the food or that i'm missing my home style food it's something else people are saying something their issue is something else you know so learning to listen helps me to move towards solutions if the if the real thing is that they're bored with the food then perhaps i have to do something else to find a solution to that maybe for example having listened i begin i begin to get a better understanding of the problem and realize oh there can be a solution to this the solution could be for example that um, um um uh once in a week let's have chinese style food once in a week let's have punjabi style food let's rotate styles that's the solution so by listening instead of saying no no food is good get lost i can actually start finding solutions around this over here the uh, so active listening uh, is just one of the many things which we can teach in schools and workshops and uh, uh, it has tremendous impact uh, there are many more things i won't go into all those details i can't go in this time um, google uh, this google how to teach conflict resolution how to teach conflict resolution you find a lot of material again uh, on this and again you will see there's actually a lot of work uh, around this uh, around the world you know the last thing i have time to talk about now is around taking this to the question of justice how do we teach about justice here again there's a lot of work around this uh, now discussing justice is actually fairly complicated actually they're all in their own ways difficult but justice is particularly complicated because people become defensive very quickly i am from a privileged background somebody is telling me there are problems and um, i i become defensive no 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 i'm not part of that i it's not i'm i didn't create any problem so don't tell me talking about justice can be difficult which is why cultivating that culture of love and dialogue are essential if i want to get people to talk about justice if i just want to fight about justice i don't need to do that but if i want to talk and persuade people and get them to understand and i also want to understand them you know building that culture of love and dialogue is very important in this uh it becomes much more easy much more productive to talk about justice if i'm using a framework of love and dialogue um again many things over here um um just one or two things one of the things is for example do talk about the causes of problems for example if there is a caste issue talk about it unfortunately 
most people aren't prepared to do that or they're not trained to do that unfortunately even many textbooks in india avoid talking about caste i I've, i've actually reviewed several states social studies textbooks and very few of them acknowledge that we have a caste problem even today you know i'm not saying caste is the only problem in this country but there is some problem uh, and it's a serious problem only i was, the ncert is one of the very few boards uh, textbooks uh, which acknowledge it most textbooks say yeah we used to have caste but it's gone it's all all right now that doesn't help you know there's lot of research on this says which you have to talk about it you have to acknowledge it we have to acknowledge look these are the causes of the problem and then we of course have to analyze why does caste operate why does it work uh, uh, in this way what are the ways in which it works what are the causes of all this analyzing it is really important and then building experiences around it doing experiential both conceptual as well as experiential learning uh, is uh, very important over here so for example doing activities uh, one of the i i saw this very nice teacher do a very nice activity um uh, she came to the class she told all the students except four students four students she said you sit where you are all the rest of the students she said she scolded them and said get up and made them go and stand in a corner and built a wall of chairs around that so the whole class except those four students were sitting in that corner standing in that corner and there was a wall of chairs and she kept scolding them stand over there i don't like you i don't like your face i don't like your dress i don't like your the kind of food you eat you four who are here you are good you people are like you know she spent 5 to 10 minutes doing this kind of an of exercise and after that she said ask the students how does it feel how does it feel that when some people have lot of resources you don't have much resources you are all cornered up in one place you have been told you are ugly you are dirty your food is bad how does it feel there are many such activities working on experiences is also crucial for talking about justice and building a feeling towards justice many more things people do i am running out of time uh, and there are some interesting questions coming up which i should respond to uh, people talk about uh, discussing and thinking about what is good and bad one of the problems of our country's education system is there's too much emphasis on memory that doesn't work you know i must we must think and talk we must discuss in the classroom is this good why is this good why isn't that considered to be good think about what is good think about what is just why is this just why is that not just think about it is very important recognizing issues is very important talking about power and there are also structures of power which create injustice acknowledging that and say that in this class we will try to take a step away from that we will try to nobody can escape power completely but we will try to step away from positions of power and try to see things in a more neutral way or try to see things from the point of view of the powerless talk about power these are ways of talking about justice and many people have tried this people have been writing about it studying it researching it and they think it makes a difference let me wrap up things uh what i've tried to say is that in today's times we need to promote a culture of love and dialogue as a way of dealing with justice it helps it's not the only thing to do but it's very valuable and not enough attention is being paid to it you know uh working on this educationally through schools colleges youth organizations at workplaces it will help people to learn one very valuable not the only but very valuable way of dealing with their issues and strengthening their ability to deal with them and to perhaps get justice when we work with young people you know like this that's how we are really investing in the future it may or may not have an immediate impact but 10 to 20 years later this is the culture hopefully with which young people will be growing up and being part of the rest of this country's activities you know this is a very valuable investment we make into the future of our country where we learn to to 
talk about issues in a dialogic way we build a bond between communities and that is the way in which to move towards justice you know it will help enormously to move towards justice if we cultivate these cultures not just amongst the oppressed you know but particularly amongst the more privileged we have to cultivate these cultures right that's what i have to say right now you know and thank you very much for listening to me there are some questions here uh which we need to talk about yeah yes thank you aman um will uh, there are many comments general comments as well as some questions also i have taken some of the questions so the first question is in a simple language how can i explain justice to children uh, uh, children uh, or youth okay many think about the legal justice yeah 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 see uh, in simple language one can try I'll, i'll try to put it but there's one or two precautions which i'll just come to in a minute in it's in simple language what we mean by justice is uh how should things be what is a fair way of doing things is justice this is one of the ways of thinking about justice how sh- what is the correct way of of organizing things in our country of who gets what who gets what respect who gets what resources what is a fair way of doing that fairness uh, is a way of thinking about justice now precautions in this one just telling it doesn't help very much because children don't understand this you know we have to do activities around it we have to ask them what do you think is justice so we have to get into conversations on this just telling them doesn't help so they'll memorize it they won't feel it i have to do activities they have to experience what is what happens if you are not being fair do we want things to be which are not fair how do i feel if things are not fair that is the way of moving towards a feeling for of commitment towards this also uh there's one more precaution there are actually several interpretations of justice i've given you one interpretation which is broadly accepted within our constitutional perspective but people will come with other perspectives on justice for example in the caste system people will say what is justice that jati that caste should be doing that work that is just that caste should be doing this work lower level work that is just this is justice people will come with these theories also so there are actually multiple theories of justice i'll also have to engage with that there again perhaps the best way of of engaging with them not is betting shut up i'll put you in jail if you talk like that or i'll beat you if you talk like that is why do you think so don't you think it's unfair you know do we want to be fair don't you think being fair is good having conversations on that building experiences on that is is the direction to move on this you know okay so the next question is our present school systems are in a mad competitive race and no space for such topics like conflicts and uh, justice uh, through which subject should uh, should i impart these ideas only through uh, yeah. social su- uh, studies or uh, through any value based education subjects right right no that's a very important question people who work on this actually have tried this out in all subjects even maths we can talk about dialogue we can talk about being reasonable even in maths you see if i'm doing a maths problem now one way of doing it is doing it on the board and saying everybody write it down i can do maths problems in groups and say okay work it out together find a solution that is cooperative learning we can do this even through maths we can do it actually with every subject we can we can teach how to work with groups be friends with people from other social groups other genders in science uh, geography everything uh, of course some subjects lend themselves more to this so social studies yes lends itself more to this because you can talk about lot more over there but literature also lends itself very well to this you know what kind of stories do i pick up what kind of 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 um, analysis do i have do i have story do i do have stories also lend itself but actually in everything one of the young researchers i work with dhruv desai has re- recently written about sports activities you know so we can do sports activities choosing activities which teach cooperation 
rather than my team is good that team is evil i have to destroy that team you know instead of that how do i do teach through sports activities learning to cooperate i have mixed teams don't have separate teams of separate groups I have mixed teams so is there a lot of possibilities in actually every part of school activities okay uh, so the next question is is ma education offered by uh, azim premchi university a skill based program or a perspective building program does ma education deal with these topics of conflict resolution justice etc right right we try to do both perspective building as well as skill building we try to do both because one is incomplete without the other just having skills without knowing why do i do this is useless just having a perspective without being able to do anything with it is also useless we try to find a balance between them you know so we try to do both uh does ma education yes there are courses which in which this is part of it uh uh it is an important part of our thing it's it's not the only thing we teach we teach a lot of other things but yes this is also present in that okay thanks aman uh, there are many comments there are they are not questions but looks like you know uh, everybody related and uh, understood the importance of justice uh, you know i mean uh, imparting justice through education okay so this one interesting comment i wish uh, the dialogue which you shared uh, happens in the workplace too so do you have any comment on this uh, sorry could you repeat that i didn't quite get that I, okay i wish the dialogue uh, which you shared happens in the workplaces ah uh, yeah yeah it's it's very necessary you know and even in workplaces it's possible to teach this it's possible to learn more about this you know it's definitely possible and many organizations do it you know they do workshops around this and to try to learn yeah okay there are no more questions uh so um i think you know we can close the session here um uh, thank you aman uh, for this lovely right. session and uh, thank you all for participating uh, wish you all the best right thank you very much <clears throat>